music and martial arts almost go hand in hand because to be fully involved with both of them, you almost have to get lost. Welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 151, and thank you for joining us today. On this episode, we hear from a man who's been teaching martial arts quite a long time, Soke Joe Drual. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the best podcast on the traditional martial arts two times a week. Welcome. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm your host for the show, as well as the founder here at Whistlekick. Thank you to the returning listeners, and welcome to those of you just checking us out the first time. I hope you enjoy your time here. We've seen a lot of sparring gear head out of the warehouse lately, even more so than the weeks leading up to Christmas. Remember, we have four colors now, and not a single pair of boots has that silly toe strap to rip or slip on or any of the other things that it causes. If you want sparring gear that lasts longer and gives you better grip on the floor, Whistlekick boots are what you want. Find them online at whistlekick.com. If you want the show notes, you can find those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That's also the easiest place to sign up for our awesome newsletter. In each of the issues, we send out some special content, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. As a thank you for joining, we're going to send you our top 10 tips for martial artists, which is an exclusive podcast episode. It's never going to be aired, and it's just for you, and it's our thank you for joining the newsletter list. Today's guest, Soke Joe Drual, comes to us from Long Island, New York. A longtime practitioner and instructor, Soke Joe has dedicated his life to martial arts, and you can hear it in his words. On today's episode, we hear why Soke Joe Drual continues to train after so many years, why martial arts is like music, and his views on the personal development side of martial arts. Have a listen. Soke Joe, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you. Well, thank you for being here. Looking forward to hearing your answers to our questions. Our guests uh, always find different ways to answer pretty much the same questions. Our, our longtime listeners know that you know, we, we take slight variances, but really we're asking the same things, and that's because everybody's different, and I don't know. I think it's fun. I like hearing how people answer the same questions differently. It tells us a lot about them. But before we go forward, we need some context for you, for who you are, for your training, for your attitude towards life. How did you get started in the martial arts? I was actually introduced when I was in school, 17 years old, I was introduced through a friend who already trained at a dojo um, in um, in New York City, and um, he was already a black belt. And uh, I was half thinking of uh, joining a couple of years previous, but uh, my parents didn't want me, obviously, to pay for you know the classes and whatever. And uh, I was thinking about it for a long, long time. And uh, we met at school and uh, after a class, and he said, "I want to." He said, "I want to show you something." So he took his thumb and he twisted it and he popped it in my chest really quick towards my solar plex region. And, and I realized that and was almost out of breath. And then I, I, then I, and then I asked him, what did you do? And he go, well, this is the, some of the stuff that I learned that maybe I want to uh, pique your curiosity about how this stuff works. So when he, uh, when he was explaining what he did, I didn't know he was training. He was already training a couple of years. And he was already a black belt. And that really intrigued me how fast it was applied and how much it left an impression on my chest, so to speak. And uh, he said, well, maybe I should actually finally go and meet with uh, the, the instructor at the school. So, of course, you did. And, you know, we, we understand now what sparked you into taking that trip to have that interest, but something kept you in the martial arts for all this time. So what was that about? What did you experience when you first started training that kept you going? Well, it's um, I was I was actually trained in college to be a uh, history teacher with a phys, with a phys ed background. And um, at at that time, my college had dropped my ed department. And um, so I had decided to do what I was already training to do was just to be a martial arts teacher because to me, martial arts is not only, uh, you know, doing the technique, but it has a lot of history behind all the forms and whatever that's hundreds of years old. And uh, it was also a physical education outlet that I was my minor in college. So I kind of like drifted into that. It was like a, like a nice, easy fit for me. All right. Nice. 
So one of the things that's kind of universal to martial artists and especially martial arts instructors, it seems, is great stories. Now, you've been training a while. I'm sure you've got a, a whole bucket of great stories. <laughs> oh, if yeah. I, if I had to pin you down and say, tell us your best one, what would that be? Um, the best, the most interesting story I've ever had was around 1976. I was teaching a outside group for the local recreation department here. And a guy walked in with his his cousin, supposedly. This was his second class. And these classes are on the outside. I don't have time to check and see who these people are and whatever. They're just like, uh, you know, register in an outside group. And they were using our facility, you know, as a as an, as an addendum to their other programs. And um, he walked in with a bat. And he put the bat near the door. He bowed on the mat. And he, he calmly looked at me. He goes, "Can you do me a favor?" I go, "What? Can you can you hit me as hard as you can with that bat? I want to know, I want to find out how it feels." So his his cousin walked back two steps. He didn't know he was going to do this, and this guy all of a sudden was not funny anymore because there were other people on the mat waiting for a class. So I calmly went up to him and I I I went to the door. I put the bat in my hand and I gave it to him. I said. Uh, can you do me a favor? Can you put your shoes back on before you bow on the mat again and, and kind of leave? I think this is going to be your last class. And then you left. But he was like wow. dead serious, Jeremy. Wow. He was what? like, I don't know. I don't know what he had in his mind, but there were people there and everything. And I had to make him leave. But I was the close, made sure I was the closest to him so that if anything did happen, I would have intercepted him. But he was dead serious. Now, that's a bit of a twist on the kind of cliche story that a lot of instructors tell someone coming in off the street, you know, challenging them to, to something. But this was almost the reverse. Yeah. It was kind of scary, really. When we finally left, I realized that the other 12 people on the mat would have been in serious danger if I didn't do anything. But I was, I was surprisingly very calm about it, and I was very respectful. I said, can you do me a favor? Can you make this your last class? Thank you very much. I said, thank you very much. And then he just turned around, thank God, and he left. A lot of people that end up in situations like that talk about that calm. And, and of course, beforehand, after, you know, I'm, I'm guessing it, you know, it, it, some of the, the emotion has probably faded from that story over the years, but as you retold it over the next couple of days, weeks, months, maybe even a few years, I bet some emotion came up and maybe even more emotion than in that moment, which I've always well, found really interesting. Well, it's actually the emotions are coming up now because I vividly remember how it happened. Okay. What do you think it is that allows people to remain so calm in those situations? It is really the martial arts training, which I almost consider not only as a physical activity with the respect, but it's almost like a meditation where you withdraw into a type of what they call motion, which is emptiness and relaxing and an openness. And another Japanese term is called zanshin, which is awareness. And the awareness of the emptiness is actually placing yourself in that position and almost pulling the emotion out of it. Okay. Other than martial arts, you know, I mean, it's, it's clear martial arts has been a big part of your life for a long time. What do you like to do? Do you have any hobbies outside of uh, training and I teaching? Play music, listen to music, play guitar. I love to read. I love to speak different languages. I speak French. I speak Spanish. I got, I just got in contact with a Chinese linguistics instructor. So I may be doing some Chinese pretty soon. Oh, neat. Now, you mentioned music. We've had a lot of guests on the show that have talked about a strong musical side to their personality. Do you think there's an overlap between martial arts and music? Um, as far as the timing, as far as the getting involved in the moment, music and martial arts almost go hand in hand because to be fully involved with both of them, you almost have to get lost and go in the flow of where it goes, or where, where the the notes go, and the music, or where the uh, the kata takes you. It's really um, it's really a nice synchronicity because mm. it's all creativity. I had never thought about it that way. That's I love that. 
one of the things that is kind of universal to all, I think all of us really, is that we, we go through hard times. And one of the things that's nice about being a martial artist is we have this whole skill set and community to lean back on when we go through something difficult. Take a moment now. Tell us about a difficult time in your life and how your martial arts helped you overcome. Went through a, um, a very bad family situation two or three times that was very emotion-based and um, very turbulent. And um, I, had my, I had my martial arts to go back on to, to calm me down. Also, I had a whole network of students and friends who I developed over the past years and decades in town and stuff and um, really helped me out. And um, I always had someone I can call. I always had someone I can talk to because all these people that I talked to when I needed help, I talked to them when they needed help. So it was kind of like a reciprocity there. And I can hear a bit of emotion in in your voice, and I'm not going to pry into what these situations are. But what do you feel it, it is about the martial arts community and the way that we really can trust each other? It's something that I've found is occurs in most of the schools that I've visited and trained at, that people really feel comfortable leaning on each other in that environment where most people don't day to day. Well, it's... The whole thing of the martial arts is not only the respect that is extended to what you're learning, but the respect and the calmness that you develop with yourself and uh, the other people that practice like that, almost like I would say they vibrate the same way. And when you have a room full of people that are calm and everything, you have a nice, calm, positive energy, whether it's two people or have an event Sometimes I go to an event and there's 100 or 200 people. It always feels the same way. It's almost like you're talking with one other martial artist to 200. It's always that calmness, that respect, the kindness. Um, they even have more respect for you when they finally realize how many years you put in and um, because they realize that how much their dedication to, to, to do that is involved. So I'm sure that over your time, you've had the chance to train with quite a few interesting people. You're in a, you're in the New York area, you're in a hotbed of martial arts and you've been there for a while. If I asked you to pin down one, maybe two people that were the most influential on your martial arts upbringing, who would they be? Uh, um, Sifu William Chen, who was a Tai Chi stylist who passed away about 10, 12 years ago who I studied with, uh, studied with one of his disciples when I was like um, 20 years old. And um, Rod, uh, Soke Rod Sakranowski, who's also my teacher for 45 years. Tell us a bit about each of them and why they had such a strong impact on you. The Tai, the tai Chi is total grounding. Um, his... His etiquette and his mannerisms as a Tai Chi master, he was very humble. Um, very grounded, very nice, very easy to approach. Uh, the teacher I have now, uh, Soke Rod Sakranowski, is, on, is the same way. He um, is in law enforcement. He teaches law enforcement for about over 50 years. He has numerous black belts and red belts. But he's extremely approachable, and he's very gentle, and, and uh, he was always easy easy to talk to because they were both, I would say, so grounded in themselves that they totally accepted the person who they were talking to and made them feel really comfortable. Mm. Nice. What do you think makes a good instructor? Um, Grounding, patience, not humility as far as being um, a welcome mat, but being firm in who you are, being comfortable in your own skin, um, realizing that the, the, the master teacher is always the master student, that when I teach someone, they're also teaching me and to, to create another example of teaching or to show me something that I can do to make my stuff better. 
because whenever I, um, I discover something that is better, I usually take, I usually tell my people, take whatever you need that you don't need uh, and practice something and replace it because, you know, we, we're always changing and, evol- and evolving. And um, I got a little lost here a bit. That's okay. Um, just just the, the master teacher is the master student, and we're always learning. And I think that that ties in with the martial arts community and realizing that their whole lifetime is learning something that is very old. The traditions are showing respect and kindness to everybody and to themselves. Self-development, and that is actually – that grounding and that respect, I think, is at the heart of all martial arts. Now, you've used that word grounding quite a bit, and different people might have a different interpretation of that. So could you just give us a little bit of the way you're using it? Grounding would be if you were first day on the mat and you came in and or you were learning a new technique from your teacher, and they would show you how to stand properly so you feel the proper balance before the technique is executed. Okay. We ask all of our guests about competition. What are your thoughts on competition? Have you participated in it? Well, I personally have not done any competition. I've always taught self-defense application. I've had people who I have trained who went into competition because they wanted to. And I always, of course, made sure that they were prepared and everything. But I always stress the fact there's a real big difference between competition and that, that the gentleman who walked in that day with the bat in the dojo. There was not like a, a referee gonna, was going to stop him or whatever. There's a right. difference between a competition sport and there's a difference between and a self-defense situation, but both are valuable because both of them teach respect and uh, grounding in the martial arts. If you could train with anybody, living, dead, worldwide, who would that be and why? Um, The Aikido master, Yoshiba, Sensei Yoshiba. Um, I would wish I'd have uh, William Chen back, the Tai Chi master. I would stay with the teacher I have now, of course, um, mm-hmm. in the past. Um, Miyamoto um, Musashi, mm-hmm. the, uh, the, the the author of the Book of Five Rings, and uh, the 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 uh, the author of uh, Sun, Sun Tzu, the author of uh, the Art of War. Why those two? I mean, obviously, those are names from. From history and, and authors of, of books that we've discussed on this show many, many times. But what, what is it about their writing that makes you want to train with them? They are totally dedicated to being centered in yourself, being respectful to yourself and other people, knowing the situation for what it is, reading it, uh, getting the most out of a situation. As opposed to a conflict, you're going with the flow of the situation and creating a new event to create something better than what you had and always evolve into something more and not accept something that's something less. How about martial arts movies? Are you a fan? Do you have uh, any yes. favorite? Oh. Yes. Any I, favorites? Um, the the uh, Expendables, um, Sylvester Stallone movies, um, who else? Uh, Joshua Stratum, the Australian actor. I don't know if I pronounced that the right way. Um, who else? Uh, of course, Bruce Lee. Um, he was groundbreaking in his movies. He made he tripled the population of all the schools in the world by them watching his movies. And uh, <clears throat> who else? Um, well, if, I, if we could pause there. Because I'd, I'd like to talk about that for a second, because I'm I'm young enough that I didn't get to witness the Bruce Lee impact firsthand. I was on the I was just starting when the Karate Kid impact happened. OK, you know, that, and, and I got to experience a little bit about what that was like. But we've had some folks on the show who have talked about this almost overnight explosion of interest in martial arts in the early 70s because of Bruce Lee. 
Could you speak to that at all? For for the, especially for those of us that didn't get to witness it. Well, here is something of things that you can do. And martial arts was almost like he showed that martial arts was a venue for how extraordinarily the body can be used, not only for the respect, but also the capability of doing extraordinary things with themselves um, to be able to set a physical or mental goal and push yourself to the limit and realize that you can go to the next limit. And he was all, Lee was all, Mr. Lee was always physically expending himself to always experiment with new things, to test new things. His, his best, I think, analogy was always be like water when you, when you pour it into a cup and then the shape of the glass itself uh, melds with the situation, which means that we have to create the moment, push the moment, realize how extraordinary somebody could be as well as respectful, but really, really accomplish something that, that you want to do that you didn't think you can do and you can do more and uh, inspire a couple of people along the way. Okay. Awesome. Now you mentioned Bruce Lee as an actor and obviously an actor that had a tremendous amount of impact on the martial arts. We've, Talked on the show before, kind of speculated that, you know, even though he's passed, even though he passed 40 years ago, he's probably still the most influential martial artist on the planet. Um, With his movie impact, absolutely. Yeah. In fact, it's still being shown. In yeah. fact, there were remakes of something um, a couple of times, and I think that that – the original Chinese movies that where he was with – I think he was in China before he came to um, the United States and hooked up with two, two, two Hollywood producers, I believe. I don't know their names, but um, that kind of like was a link up to all the old arts. And then he was like almost like a bridge from the old art, the old Chinese movies where they showed all their weapons and stuff and all their fighting technique to almost like a modern concept where the Americans can adopt you know, when they're living lifestyle to all these old traditions and uh, and the, the angle of bridging that with the respect and the culture and everything, I found that very interesting. Is there anybody else that comes to mind that's had a substantial impact, either through movies or or other methods? Um, no, nah, I can't think of anybody who offend. There's a couple of different ones. There's a lot of Hollywood actors. Um, the movie that I think that was a, a, as a remake of uh, the Magnificent Seven was the Seven Samurai, yeah. and Toshiro Mufuni actually starred and he produced it. it. Was a classic, and here is Samurai, which means the art of serving, really um, servants, not servitude, but serving and dedication, where they had the Seven Samurai protect this these band of farmers against all these bandits that were robbing them and hurting them for years and they took a stand and the thing is they they did it out of out of helping them out and being protective and they and, and actually the whole thing they could have walked away anytime they wanted to but they didn't right on now you also mentioned in in part of your earlier answer about the art of war and the book of five rings are there any other martial arts books that speak to you? Um, I've read um, articles in like Black Melt Magazine, Official Karate, but I think that I think that Black Belt Magazine and their articles there, or you know, Kung Fu Tai Chi Magazine, where they 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 show the the culture from different countries and martial arts and they also show modern um modern application i think that that, that should those are things people should read while they're practicing because that gives them a good idea what the application of martial arts can be applied in the in the you know today mm. i think one of the things i enjoy a lot about reading magazines martial arts magazines is that you get to see the evolution in a, a much more steady state. You know, if we, if we read a book 
that came out three years ago, the author probably started it three, four, five, ten years before that. You know, so what we're reading now could be 15, 20 years old. And of course, our approach to martial arts, um, our, our perspective, our society, you know, that's the context it fits in has changed. But yeah, when we talk about magazines, the lead time to get something in front of your eyeballs is so much shorter. Um, yeah. But the thing is, all those, some of those articles are timeless because, you know, I, I was a, I was going to be a history professor and believe it or not, history does repeat itself, Jeremy. And, um, you know, we have to, I don't know, we have to learn a little bit from, from what, from what things that the best that come out of us and the worst that come out of us and try to do the things that are best. And I think that, martial arts have done the right way brings out brings out the best in us could you expand on that a little bit more talk about the what you see as the right way and the wrong way right way would be um in contact between the teacher and a student or a coach or a, a student or a client whatever you want to call it is to uh recognize and tell and, and make this make the student aware of the commitment um, show them what they have to do. Make them realize that. Make them realize that you are the product first. That they have to follow. That the 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 teacher or the coach has to lead by example, not by just talking. Um, if you lead by example, you will keep people a lot more longer than people that you know talk a big game, but they do not back up what they say. And that really, really is important. That I want to dig into that a little bit because I, there, there are different ways that I could interpret what you're saying. So I, I would just appreciate a little bit of clarity. Are you talking about demonstration of skill? Or are you talking about uh, the way people conduct themselves in the world, both, something else? Demonstration of skill and and being respectful inside and outside the school or the training area. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. And so of course the wrong way would be not doing those things. Yeah. I mean, just it, it's, it's, if, 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 if there's a respectful intention or respectful situation in any situation, including martial arts, um, the respectful way would be that you're actually learning a skill because to me, this is not is a lifestyle. This is a way of thinking. It's a mindset, and it's something that you should be able to practice for the rest of your life. You've been training a long time. I'm sure you're going to keep going. I'm sure you're going to keep teaching. Why? What is it that's kept you so motivated for so long? Um, just a quick story. Please. I called I called someone up um, who I taught in 1978, who now lives in Florida, who was a student of mine for 26 years before he moved away. And he said that because of my, he says he's very grateful that I'm continuing. I could have very easily found another venue or employment for doing something and doing this part time instead of full time. What I do is to there was a couple of occasions where five, two near death experiences where the martial arts training I gave him saved his life. Would you be able to share those with us? Um, one was he is in construction and he was on a second story building and he was up about 25 feet over a deck and he fell off the ladder backwards. He took the fall on the deck. He was very, he was kind of, he was very bruised, very shaken up. But when he went to the hospital, he didn't, he didn't snap any bone in his body. Mm. <laughs> he was a jujitsu stylist and jujitsu, they, they teach you how to fall and how to keep the body sure. nice and soft. Sure. Saved his life, saved his life. Yeah. And the other, he remind mm -hmm. he remind no he reminded me of that and um, um yeah there was uh, two occasions where there was three couple occasions I'd rather not you know be too particular about it where they sure, actually sure. had a, it was a life threatening situation and he had to they had to 
they had to take someone's life, unfortunately. Mm. That's that's something that fortunately so few of us have to ever experience. Um, yeah. You know, and I, I've, I've spoken with individuals in law enforcement who have had that experience. And yeah, yeah. Something I wouldn't wish upon anyone. Yeah. So it's the knowledge that you're truly helping your students, that you're helping to keep them alive, is, that, is what is your motivation. It's a huge payback and a huge uh, incentive, and um, it's very actually very gratifying, a lot of... A lot of positive value reflection, Jeremy. So now take a moment, promote yourself. You know, it's kind of our commercial time for our guests. If people are interested in learning more about you, about your school, about what you offer, do you travel and give seminars, you know, whatever it is, tell us about Soke Joe and, and what people might want to engage with you on. Um, do I've been teaching full time for 45 years. The school that I was an apprentice to was founded in 1966, and we've been here in Huntington Village for 50 years. We celebrated our anniversary October 1st, and um, I have done corporate events. I have done parties. I have done demonstrations. I have taught women's and men's group. I have I have done. Um, you know, numerous classes I've uh, done to high schools, and I also I also teach for the New York City Guardian Angels, and um, I teach them actively now for the past five years, and um, for the community, and um, and they could just expect about fifty five thousand hours worth of experience and caring. It's not the fact that I have all my knowledge; it's the fact that I really care about helping people out. Mm. Wow. Tell, could you talk a little bit about, about the Guardian Angels? It's a subject that hasn't come up on the show, but I know there's a strong martial arts tie. The New York City Guardian Angels are, have chapters in different countries, Latin America, Europe, uh, Canada, Japan, and um, their martial arts background helps them in when they're doing like street patrols and they're engaging in the neighborhoods in the community. And, um, uh, we show them, of course, you know, stuff that we don't show to the regular regular public sometimes. And being that they have to actually use this, they they first started on the trains in 19 New York City subway system in 1979, and they were originally the Rock Brigade, and they're still doing the trains up, up to this day. But now they're they extended in the community. They do we do I like I do presentations and speeches for them about um, children, children's schools, going to schools and going to gyms and telling them not to go into gang activity, but showing respect for the parents in the community. So the the street patrol actually, and the things that they're known for originally is actually probably about 30% of their activity. The other 70% is dealing with uh, different community events. Mm. It's a wonderful organization and one that I hope continues that there doesn't seem to be as much recognition of what they're doing as there was uh, a couple decades ago yes well there's a there's increasing gang activity in um, different cities now and um, i think uh, i think the civil unrest for the next two years is going to go up from what it is now and i think the gang activity is going to increase too and i think we're going to i think their services are going to be even more valuable to the community mm -hmm. So if someone's listening and they just heard you make that comment, that that prediction, and unfortunately I, I agree with you, that we're going to see an increase in some less than favorable elements of our society, what would you recommend to someone who is a martial artist? Because most people listening here are martial artists. What would you recommend that they do to prepare? Um, all the all the moves in martial arts, most of the kata that were originally used was to, to transfer knowledge of one technique to another technique, whether it's a judo move that has three moves or a kata that has 65 moves to become um, more reality based in their community and uh, show more self-defense application and also increase the, um, 
the awareness that martial arts is also meditation so they can learn how to not only protect themselves but you know a little relaxation and stress relief if people if people learn how to relax and get and, and get and get stress relief and then get an outlet into something of a positive energy um we'll have more positive positivity in the population mm-hmm. wonderful i agree and as we close up what we're talking about here, any parting advice, words of wisdom, if you will, for those listening? If you are practicing martial arts, continue. It will keep you nice, healthy, and happy. Uh, and it will also make you feel protected because you can take care of yourself. If you know of anyone that has been thinking of martial arts training, have them go down to the nearest school and sign up immediately because they don't know what they are missing. And for all the people that have trained in the past and are thinking of coming back, rush through the door and do it right away. When you hear Soke Joe talk, you can tell that he's certainly a thoughtful man who really cares about the martial arts. And he cares about those that choose to make it their passion just as much. Thank you, Soke Joe, for your time on the show today. Over at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com, you can find the show notes with links to the things we discussed today, as well as links to other great episodes. You can follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram. And our username is Whistlekick. You should also check out our Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, behind the scenes. We're always open to new guests for the show. So if you want to come on or maybe recommend somebody that you know, we'd love to hear from you. There's a forum to do that at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com. If you have feedback, we'd love to hear that too. You can drop us a line on the website, social media, or email us, info at Whistlekick.com. Be sure you're subscribed to the podcast feed so you never miss out on an episode. And if you want to help us out, you know, there's a lot of ways you can do that. Our favorite one, tell somebody else about the show. The bigger we get, the bigger the guests we get, the more fun it is for everybody. So really, that's all I'm going to ask of you today. If you want to check out our sparring boots, though, we're totally cool with you doing that. Head on over to whistlekick.com. You can see why I keep talking about them, why they're the best boots you'll ever find why I personally designed them to be that the way they are. Maybe I should do an episode on that. Anyway, I really mean it when I say there's nothing like them. Now, if you're a school owner or a team coach, wholesale.whistlekick.com is the place to go. For all of you, until next time, thanks for checking us out. Remember, train hard, smile, have a great day.